Hey guys, what's up? So in this video, I'm talking about why is web development so hard? And um, and a lot of people are going to be like, well, web development's not hard, and I, I find it to be easy and things like that. And um, a lot of those people that are saying that are probably not speaking with any sort of real experience. Um, so a lot of times when, when you're a beginner, you think things are easier than they really are because you haven't challenged yourself uh, in the way that you're going to be challenged when you actually go into an industry, work with a team of developers on cutting-edge software. Um, so anytime you start getting... Uh, down that path where like you become overconfident like if you're self-taught like not working in the industry yet I would probably caution uh, you on, on being too overly um, Optimistic, I mean it's good to be optimistic, but at the same time you can easily be over optimistic in the programming world so um, There's this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect and that actually is something that you can also find in the uh, corporate environments as well people that like get into positions and make decisions that um, you know, that really just aren't very good because they're so sure of them, their talents and their, um, you know, and their, and their expertise. And, and, and a lot of times it's like completely fabricated. It's just in their own mind. And um, when you compare them to, you know, other people that, that do make sound decisions, they're not very good at all. Um, so that you're going to find that, I think, anywhere. Uh, well, not really anywhere, but uh, you're going to find that occasionally, especially in, in uh, you know, really large companies, I would say. But um, for the most part, like well-run IT organizations, they're going to have people in place that are truly smart and know, know how to make, um, you know, really good decisions. Um, and one of the reasons why I feel like web development is so difficult these days is like when React first came out, I was doing React, I think in 2014, 2015, I'd have to go back and look at my earliest videos, but, um, I had been, you know, getting into the whole React and, and the whole JavaScript, uh, you know, really the, the model view view model kind of pattern and everything with an MVC um, but that's really not not relevant but so w when I first started getting into react it was much easier like we, we had JSX and JSX was something I hated but eventually I grew to like it and uh, you know I would use my JSX transpiler and and really I just had to include like a react file um, and but then you know all of a sudden everything kind of shifted over to the whole ES6 thing where the browsers didn't support ES6 So you started adding a lot more complexity when it came into like um, using things like Gulp and Browserify uh, And then you know now we're introducing Babel and Webpack and, and Rollup and all these other things but um, the fact of the matter is though is that that web development is harder than it's ever been um, and I'm gonna get into a few reasons why I think that might be but uh, I can tell you that the the entire industry itself, I mean, has gone towards like these microservices where you have uh, you don't need to have monolithic uh, APIs that, that render everything for everybody. Like um, it, it's all about, you know, if you're going to have like a software as a service type of model, um, you should have multiple different endpoints. So that way, if you're if one endpoint goes down, like you could still kind of scale back the amount of uh, functionality that your website could have. Um, if you have, you know, five different uh, API endpoints that are providing five different features of your app. So if, if feature A goes down, well, feature A is down and there's not much you can do about that, but at least the entire app is not down. Um, but even more than that, um, by breaking things up into so much, uh, so many different APIs, especially these microservice APIs that you hear about, um, it really, it allows people to focus independently on different pieces of, of uh, the architecture. And... And, and, and that is actually very beneficial. I don't think that there's you know, really any problem with that whatsoever. Um, but where you then have to tie all of this stuff in to, together um, is where like the real, real complexity be, you know, gets, gets involved. Um, the, the entire React, um, and really I would say the entire ES6, um, this, the, the ES6 way of writing web apps can get so damn convoluted very quickly uh, it's unbelievable with the amount of work that JavaScript is now doing. Um, it, it makes things very, very challenging. So, if you did the React and you built a few basic, simple stuff in React, well, that's nothing. I mean, try then taking your project and uh, and, and you got to think of like a massive project where you then try to implement maybe Flux or Redux or something like that. Um, the, the the point is though is that things can get really, really complicated very, very fast, and that's why like you have to have. Uh, browser tools like the the Redux Dev tools or uh, React Dev tools, and, and the same thing, the same concept is for Angular as well. One of the concerns about Angular One was that stuff became so out of control so quickly that um, it looked great on the To Do app and things like that. But then, it, you know, as things 
scaled up in complexity and as you had like large teams um you you were fighting the framework you were fighting the overall design it became a, you know a convoluted pile of shit basically so if react came along and they do it much better they have a much closer component based system um, Redux offers a, a pretty good op, uh, option for like a shared state amongst those components. But things can get very, very complicated because in addition to all of that stuff, like I said, you're tying in all different kinds of pieces of functionality still. Whether you're connecting to um, like third party APIs, or your own APIs, um, there, there's, there's database layers, there's all this business logic and things like that. A lot of that stuff has been pushed over to the client now. So you, you still have like uh, you know, intermediary services that can end up existing between um, like a, an API to, to get, you know, Google Maps data or something like that. And then you have some sort of, uh, you know, a repository type of API that you're communicating with that's acting as like a translation layer. Uh, and then another one that acts as a translation layer to, to then take, take your data that, that you've manipulated and then, just, you know, put it in the form that, that is uh, able to be saved upon, within you know your your database that, that you end up uh, storing that in. This is just an example. Basically, shit gets really really complicated when you have uh, large scale enterprise applications that you're working on, um, and then you have to multiply that by like you know what maybe uh, 30, 40 developers sometimes that are all checking into the same code base. So you got to make sure people aren't stepping on each other's toes, and um, and then every piece of functionality should also have unit tests tests. So um, whoever thinks that like you know writing modern day React applications is somehow easier than what we used to do is actually you know they're they're out of their mind. Um, so I've seen some you know pretty talented developers str struggle with this stuff, and um, you know th this entire senior dev mindset now that exists in 2017 is all about how well do you you pick up this stuff? Like how quickly can you pick it up? How quickly can you tie things together based on experience and, and just your, your overall understanding? I mean, your research capabilities of using Google or other uh, internal services within the company. How well do you communicate within your team? Um, how well do you, t you do your test? I mean, how, um, how thorough are you with, with testing your code? That's actually something that, um, that, that sometimes I falter at, and, and really everybody does to some extent, but you know, you'll miss certain things that um, you, you feel like you should you should have missed because you're kind of um, you know in this tunnel vision focusing on the happy path. Oh, it seems like it works during this one thing, but then you know you start tinkering eight, eight or nine different variables, um, and and your output could be completely uh, unexpected. Especially when you have JavaScript now that is listening to all kinds of different things like on key ups and on key downs and on blurs and on focus and all this stuff that is firing off all these events. You know, using tools like Redux and and React and and I know that I keep focusing on React, React, uh, React and uh, React because that's what I've been using a lot lately. lately but it's no different with any other more modern day uh, approach as well. Like maybe Vue.js is going to uh, simplify that a little bit, but you're also not going to be building the same large scale enterprise applications. I mean, I don't see that being adopted uh, too much right now in the corporate world. Not as much as uh, people seem to be going head over heels with React uh, architecture, but um you know this it's really difficult so why is it so difficult and re really you know as we progress i think that, that that we're trying to make better tools and i think that you know react is is pretty cool but it's much more complicated now to, to write react than it used to be um and and some of the reasons for that though is that i i really think it's because we have people that are put in positions um, you know, that are extremely smart. Like the creator of Redux, Dan Abramoff, is, is clearly a very smart guy. He now works for Facebook, but um, he's probably too smart to be writing web apps, you know, CRUD applications. He should probably be working on like machine learning and big data and like artificial intelligence or something that would maybe suit him a little bit better. He's obviously very, you know, very fond of um, Evan Kaplitsky, I think, from the Elm programming language, uh, Harvard graduate, you know, so like, you know, some very smart people that, you know, that are building some very smart things. Like if you look at modern day web developers that are coming out with some of these tools, I really feel like the overall usefulness of them really pales in comparison to what you saw like during the 1950s at Bell Labs or in the 1940s, you know, 50s, all the way into the 60s and 70s at a company like Bell Labs where, you know, you gave birth to Dennis Ritchie who created the C, uh, the C programming language that every major language has been built uh, off of. Um, you know, that same level of usefulness, I don't see, I don't see it coming out of Google. I don't see it coming out of Facebook. And one of the reasons why the, this is the case is because 
companies don't seem to be spending as much on research and development as they did back in the old days. One of the reasons why Bell Labs was able to create so many ingenious things was because they had a monopoly on their industry all the way back to the early 1900s. So in order, uh, in part of their monopoly uh, regulations, they could not compete in new industries. So they had some of the best talent working for them uh, in some of these think tanks in New Jersey and, and Manhattan. And, um, and they would come up with certain things like literally like, uh, you know, the, the beginnings of the transistors and, and the, the semiconductors and the microchips and things. I mean, they all kind of uh, grew up out of that entire environment out there and, uh, and they weren't able to just compete. So companies like Texas Instruments were able to come in and, and use some of these, uh, these patents. Well, they, they were patents that um, weren't exclusive to like, you know, to Bell Labs, even though they developed the technology, like companies like Texas Instruments were able to take the technology and build the transistor radio and to build, uh, you know, pocket calculators that ended up being uh, extremely popular. And um, so the point I'm trying to make is that like, some of the smartest talent that worked for some of those companies, like that, we have in some ways the same level of smart people when it comes to like Evan Kaplitsky and, and writing the Elm programming language. But do we need it? Do it like it, are we making the world a better place because of it? I would actually argue that we're really not. Like it's great, you know, it's very smart. Like you overly complicated something that probably doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, and the benefits, like if they, if it was clearly that beneficial, I mean, it's been around since 2012, we would see more cutting edge stuff where it's like, oh, we have to jump on that because this is, this is creating some new thing for us. So the problem with web development, development right now is that you're going to go out and you're going to spend a ton of money trying to pay senior developers that can tie together very, very complicated architecture using this modern JavaScript ES6. And, um, and you're going to have a lot of people that used to be able to flourish under you know, just basic web applications and CRUD applications using jQuery and tying together some data and things like that, because most of the applications don't need to be that complicated. Um, whereas like now everybody seems to feel like, you know, that every CRUD application needs to use Vue.js as a template engine or that you need to use React and Redux and all that stuff. And like we're finding ways to pigeonhole this technology and we've been doing it for like decades now, it seems like. And, um, and we're not like getting anywhere as fast as, as we would like. Um, at least in my opinion now, there's probably other, you know, like obviously there's, there's, there's advancements being made in other industries. There's no question about that, but strictly in the web development world, we don't need the level of complexity that we've added into our lives, um, because it actually is not providing a huge business advantage. Um, it even react, um, if you look at like react, okay, they've been, it's being used by Facebook, like Facebook has a, a successful business model, but it's not because of react. Right. And like even Facebook's website isn't overly impressive. So it's like, okay, they're using react and it helps them out be as a business and they had a business need and they created it. Um, but it, no, it doesn't necessarily make them like a, like a, it doesn't, in my opinion, they don't have a better product. Like I don't find their UI to be any more intuitive or better than something like uh, Google's YouTube or like, um, like I look at indeed, uh, not indeed. Well, indeed is like old school and indeed probably, I mean, one of the reasons why they have so many listings and they're able to handle so much traffic is probably because they didn't add so much complication. And, um, you look at something like Craigslist, I mean, they're able to get by and be one of the most popular websites, um, without all that complexity. Same with Wikipedia, same with um, you know, a lot of these other sites that, that just don't need that level of complexity and they're, because their business doesn't really call for it. Um, and, and the mistake that a lot of businesses are making is that they think they need, you know, some of these tools and they have to pay the best and the brightest to be able to handle it because it's adding a, a hell of a lot of complexity to what used to not be so complex. Now you're going to tell me, oh, well, try tying together a bunch of DOMs and stuff with uh, jQuery and blah, blah, blah. You'll, you'll know why React was born. Yes, I understand that. So if you have a very, very complicated uh, architecture, then yes, React makes sense. If you have Wikipedia or Craigslist, you don't need React. It's plain and simple. You don't. You're going to add complexity. So there, there is that distinction. I'm not, I'm not, you know, blind to that, that, you know, if you have a truly very, very complex UI, you're going to, you're probably going to want to do something with react. Um, however, like I will say that, you know, with, you know, the level of complexity that you now have with ES6 and ES7 and Babel and Webpack and all the different Babel plugins, you know, 150 different plugins that you're using within your package.json, you're creating projects that are very, very unmanageable. 
Um, so you're going to have to pay the top level talent. So you really need to like balance that trade off and say, okay, whatever sort of application I'm building, do I really need to use these tools? Because I mean, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is that there are, there are, there are developers out there and quite a bit of them that just won't be able to hang in this market. They, they really won't. Um, I've seen many of them at my old job. Like they're, they're just not going to be able to do it. So, um, the thing is, so I think that some of the talent that is actually producing some of these tools, uh, you know, they're, they're very good at, at you know, it, promoting them. Um, they're obviously smarter than some of the people around them. So, you know, they're able to probably run circles as to the benefits of certain things. Um, but once again, I think that, you know, overall, like we need as many programmers as we can get. Um, where we used to have so many different web developers that did a lot of CSS and things like that, you had like a few standouts, but then Bootstrap came along and everybody realized it was much easier to use Bootstrap. Um, and things became more difficult. So now you had to step, you had to, you know, step up your game and do better than Bootstrap. And, and kind of the same thing is being done, I would say with the web tooling world, like we're always trying to, uh, you know, one up each other. As far as the next project, you know, if it's React or Inferno or something that comes beyond, you know, beyond that. But, um, you know, the end game that I see is that we're not writing necessarily better applications. I, I really don't, I don't think we are. Um, not, not from a maintainability perspective, uh, a performance perspective, uh, or even, you know, a joy of use perspective. So I miss the old days of, uh, of jQuery, to be honest with you. Like, uh, I miss those days of of uh, being overly confident that I'd be able to get something done just because, you know, it was so much easier to do. Um, at the same time, having things more difficult can also have benefits to those that can thrive in this market. So once again, there's probably too many physicists and, um, you know, advanced masters and PhD you know, math mathematicians and things like that that are getting involved in the programming world as far as web development where they probably don't really need to be but the problem is is most of the jobs are in web development so um and and then not a lot not enough technology is being uh introduced by some of these these companies like apple and google like when it comes to like writing a better web server like you, you don't see that very often you're seeing nginx and, and apache and uh, ias and those things aren't really coming along and replacing that um like because there, there's just there's not as much money, I guess there's not as many jobs like to pay for that. In fact, one interesting um, tidbit is that in 2011, both uh, Apple and Google spent more money fighting with each other over patents than they did on research and, and development. So um, you're you're looking at two of the the you know the the, the biggest companies uh, with with the most cash that were spending more cash on fighting their patents and their existing patents over, you know, and fighting with each other over that than actually researching newer uh, and better products. So anyway, just my thoughts, man, what web development is, is difficult. It's going to get more difficult. Um, you know, best of luck to everybody trying to get, you know, get to, to try to get into this industry. Um, eventually I think we're going to realize that we we're, we're making ourselves making our lives a little bit more complicated than they need to be. And it's going to, and it's increasing business costs and everything else. So, um, you know, the markets will, will correct themselves eventually. Uh, and I'm not even trying to say that React and Redux are not good tools. I'm just simply saying that people need to pump the brakes on some of these tools that they're introducing into their basic applications that don't need them. Um, all right, guys. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye. Hey, guys. So a lot of you ask me, how do I get my foot in the door to become a programmer? And I just want to take a moment to mention Dev Mountain Coding Bootcamp is a 12-week intensive course that focuses on the technologies of the here and now for web development. Uh, some of the things that they're actually teaching in this 12-week course, it's geared to get you into the, the industry by focusing on things like jQuery, Node.js, React, Angular, how to use GitHub. So a lot of the things that you're going to need to do as a developer, as soon as you start, they're going to be teaching you in this in this coding boot camp. And the entire goal is to be able to get you into the industry within 12 weeks. So if you guys are interested in learning more information about Dev Mountain Coding Boot Camp, just check out the link in the description tab of this video. Thank you for watching and have a good day.